Welcome to another Walkworthy podcast. We are heading into the fall season. We're on the brink of many people returning to regular rhythms and routines. And uh, we're still very eager to hit our uh, full stride here, if I can put it that way. Um, not that because anyone's been doing a poor job or anything like that, quite the contrary. But uh, we were reflecting before we hit record that it's been since May uh, we're all four of us pastorally, we're in the same room together. And that may not happen yet for another six, seven weeks or so, uh, as we continue to pray for uh, Pastor Kevin's recovery. So uh, yeah, it'll be a moment to celebrate when we're all four of us actually in the same room. So with sabbatical, vacation, parental leave, now some medical leave, uh, we have been uh, in some different places and spaces. So, uh, but I'm very glad to be with Caleb and Sergey today as we discuss the final sermon in Paul's letter to the Galatians. And uh, before we touch the sermon text and the content of that uh, particularly, I just wanted to uh, throw a few comments or questions your way, Caleb. This is the first time on a Sunday morning in the life of a local church where your hands solely have been on a preaching series. Uh, well, an Advent series. You've, mm-hmm. you've helped uh, you've helped uh, carve out some Advent series, but taking a whole book of Scripture, dividing it up, all that sort of stuff. You want to just talk about what that journey was like, doing that on a Sunday morning for the first time? Things you learned, appreciated, enjoyed, things that you find difficult about that, or if that was the case. Uh, just talk us through that whole journey of preaching, I think you said 10 out of 14 sermons on a series. I didn't divide the text. I didn't, I didn't touch this at all. You assigned me texts um, when I came back from sabbatical. So yeah, do you want to just talk about that journey for a few minutes? Yeah, I thought it was really helpful even just um, when it came to preaching prep rhythms. So I, you know, have aspired to get better at the rhythms that I have. And hopefully in the next, you know, number of decades, that will only get better and better and better. So, yeah, I think I fell into a rhythm as things went on. Typically, I was preaching once every five weeks, you know, once every six weeks before that. And, you know, after seven, eight years of doing that, I started to realize, okay, this is what I need for my process. But then, you know, I think I preached four in a row and then five in a row um, before you got back. And it was very helpful to preach a sermon and then on Monday be like, okay, do it again. Next text. And then the following Monday, okay, next text. And um, not as much time to meditate on the text before that particular week, although um, there was, there was a be- while that wasn't a thing, there was still a benefit to meditating on the previous texts because every text has a context. And the better you know that context, I find, um, the, the more focused your prep is. You're not doing as much background work. You're not doing as much um, thematic work. Every book has a theme. You know, Paul, when, when you read through Galatians, you're not going to think that grace necessarily is one of the main themes of Galatians, but then you start to work through it, and you go, wow, he brings this up quite a bit. You know, you look at Galatians, and you say, it's justification by faith, right, which is, you know, part of the whole grace equation, but then you start to see, wow, the word grace is used quite a bit here, and it's used as an umbrella term to describe a lot of the particularities of, of what's going on in the book of Galatians. And then I also made the comment this last Sunday that, you know, I used to think that Galatians was, if, if you're going to summarize it in a phrase, it's justification by faith, which I think is a very good summary sure. and is probably the main theme of Galatians. But I think maybe on level with that, is this whole reality that we are a a new people, that something new has happened because the cross has taken place. That's what Paul's trying to convince the Galatians of. Don't go backwards. Something new has taken place. And he's trying to uh, not just introduce them, but school them in the newness of what's taking place. So uh, being able to Were you expecting that before you started Galatians to, to discover that? No. Um, there was like this underlying recognition that that was a, a reality, but it didn't seem like a main thing. Whereas the more I went through, the more I was going, wait a second, this is a main emphasis of this book. Something new has happened, Christian. So now, maybe in future ministry, if I were to ever come back to this book, I would highlight some of those particularities, um, not differently because I think I did it wrongly sure. the first time through, 
but I think I would be more invested in some of the wording earlier on as it pertains to preaching than I was when I preached through those texts. There is definitely something happens that happens when you are immersed in a book of the scriptures for a period of time. And when preparing to preach, you know, we read through the book, we, we, we do our best to get a sense of it, but you're not doing the the same in-depth work that you would before a sermon series as you're doing in preparing for each sermon that you preach. So the way that you see a book at the outset of a preaching series will adjust uh, as you look back on that book at the end of a preaching series. And that's good because it means that you're being shaped by the Word of God and you're not only bringing, uh, merely bringing your view to the text, but it's shaping you, forming you, and it's just wonderful, wonderful to hear you reflect on that as you've gone through it. So, Cool to see some of the parts that, you know, we often sort of skip through as well, which is like, here's how I traveled, here's a little bit of my bio, Paul says, and you're going, okay, why is that important? Mm-hmm. Why do I need to know where Paul was and why he was doing this or why he didn't see the apostles and when he did see the apostles? And it's all because the gospel matters and because this gospel is a gospel of God and not a man-invented gospel. And so it's cool to like wrestle with those particular texts and a cursory reading of those. You kind of go, ah, is that is that really going to change my life? But then you start to realize why he's giving this information. So you know, you you pick up all those points in a mm-hmm. book as well. You know, we're about to hit in Exodus some of the Lord's commands with respect to the tabernacle. And I think that maybe the typical Christian would read through those and go, mm. I don't know if that affects my spirituality yes. very much. But by God's grace, when we are through those 20 chapters, we will all see, wait a second, the Lord has something to say to me through these texts. Anyway. A great a great question to ask, I believe, <clears throat> whenever we're coming to a portion of Scripture, is why has the Holy Spirit inspired this? Yeah. Why is it here? What function, what purpose does it serve? Uh, how does it... Uh, what what would happen if it wasn't there? Yeah. We just imagine, which we'd never do, but just imagine it, it was taken out. What difference would it make if it was absent? And I think those kinds of questions can really help us get at the the meaning, the purpose. Why does the Spirit want us to know this in particular? Because there are many questions we have about the Lord and His ways, and that we're just not told. Uh, there's a lot of there's still mystery to our faith, and so I sometimes we might wish oh, I I wish there was more clarity on this or more information on that, but. No, God has chosen not to give us those things. So why has the Spirit put this, put this here is a really good question to wrestle through. Um, what do you learn about just preaching? So we, you talk a little bit about Galatians, but you, you talk about that rhythm of, you know, five in a row, four in a row, 10 out of 14. Um, you, you just what did you learn about yourself? What did you learn about the act of preaching? Any insights? Or I, I'm putting you on the spot with this question, but I'm um, curious. Trust the Lord in a twofold sense. Um, number one, sometimes I would get to a certain point in the week and I would be like, okay, this is like the fourth one in a row. And I don't have much more to say about works righteousness because I've said it for four weeks now. And I don't have much more illustrations <laughs> that will be helpful to God's people. And so like, where do I go? And in that moment, I'm realizing, you know, if, if, if any panic is starting to set in, which, I mean, there's never any crazy panic. Pressure, but, though, right? The, there's but, some pressure. Yeah, Sunday mm-hmm. is a pressure, mm-hmm. right? And you go, okay, no, no, there is a particular facet of the diamond in this text that the Lord reemphasized for a reason. And the Lord will supply the application and the illustration via what that particular um, facet of the diamond looks like. And so it's just, you know, look harder, dig deeper, pray more fervently. Great. So that was helpful. The the second aspect of trust, which was helpful for me, is, you know, maybe this is a bad thing to admit publicly, but sometimes you finish a sermon and you go, ah, that didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I didn't feel like I slept perfectly the night before, I didn't feel like I was perfectly fluid or clear in my mind. There's always something happening in your head while your mouth is moving. And uh, I'm usually, you know, three or four seconds ahead of my sermon in my head. 
And so like sometimes that, that mental side of things isn't as um, clear and fluid as you'd want it to be. Um, sometimes you notice things in the auditorium that you um, interpret or you um, wish you hadn't noticed while you were preaching. And you get, you know, you get down afterwards and you go, ah, that didn't feel very good. And I realized that sometimes when it comes to preaching, I rest on how I felt that sermon went. Which is very subjective. Yeah. And then, you know, but walking away from it, you know, sometimes you'll get feedback and people, you know, they won't say, oh, that's the best sermon I've ever heard. That's not what you're looking for. But they'll say, man, oh man, like when you, when you hit this particular point, that really helped me understand the text. And it's not just like a passing comment. They can only articulate two seconds of, you know, what the Lord did in their life. No, no, no. They were dialed in for that. And you go, oh, well, praise the Lord. That's exactly what I was aiming to communicate because that's what the text communicates. Man, are my feelings ever askew. Sure. And so just trusting the Lord for, like, this has been planted and watered. And you know what I need to get better at um, as a result of having preached more? I need to get better at... um, You know, H.B. Charles had this article that he put out for Midwestern years ago, and I bookmarked it on my computer, but I don't go back to it often enough after I've preached. And the article was, here are things to do after you've preached. Thank the Lord for the opportunity. Thank the Lord for the truth. Pray that the Lord would bring fruit. Anyways, I just, I I don't do that enough. And I, I, you know, would like to start doing that a little bit more. That's good. All part of the journey of uh, growing in... Uh, the gift that the Lord has given you, seeing it fanned into flame, you just have to experience those things, That's right? right? Uh, as uh, as a preacher, and uh, I'm I'm really glad that you did. So, it's one good. thing I, I want to ask: Did this make you feel you want to do this more or less? I, I would love to preach more. Yeah, I mean, I love the preaching ministry. This could have gone word. sideways, like yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, <laughs> never again in my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's right. It's hard work. But it is good work. Mm-hmm. It is it is some of the best of the pastoral work, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, I just I love it. Well, we d- we certainly don't want to. Uh, we certainly want to do everything that we can to ensure that the gift that God has given you is only fanned into flame all the more. Which I believe happened. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But we've talked about a different like a different rhythm of one and in four instead of one and five or six. So that that's something that more regularly that you're doing in the life of our church, which I think is good and right um, because uh, of the gift that God has given to you. So we'll look forward to uh, to more of that um, at, at Hespler Baptist. Uh, the uh, What did I say I would come back to? I've forgotten already. I've forgotten already. Wow, that's really bad. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> oh, no, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so this is what I was going to say. Um, I That's the first time I've heard you preach in months. Because I preached the three sermons prior to that. Yeah. So is that, is that did true? Did you hear Sarah and Hagar? Yes, I did. That's true. So I've heard you preach twice mm-hmm. since I've been back and notice a difference. Oh, praise God. And your your progress is evident. Like oh, I just not seeing that happen for a while, then coming back after nine, ten sermons. And uh, so uh, my, my 15-year-old and I were chatting about that after the service on Sunday mm-hmm. and just noting... Uh, there's a difference in Caleb in uh, just your uh, uh, presence, confidence, conviction. Uh, you seem much more comfortable being who God made Caleb to be in the pulpit and in preaching than I think I've ever seen you before, mm-hmm. which I think only comes from that repetition mm-hmm. and that doing more of and that back-to-back. And so that was really wonderful to see. Just, just a delight to watch that um, unfold. So well, I'm glad you said wonderful because Caleb's a pretty weird dude. So if that comes out in the pulpit, <laughs> no, in no. every manifestation, no, it, it, was, it does sometimes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we're all weird once you get to know us. But uh, so I definitely saw that brother, and just want to commend that. Um, and I just that um, was just enjoyable, and I uh, noticed. Uh, even by a young man in our congregation, perhaps even others. I've heard comments from church members as well on your preaching ministry when I was gone, and uh, it's all just affirmed very evidently, uh, clearly, that the Lord has given you a gift, and it's just uh, uh, rejoice to see it get put to you. So here's to more of that.
Well, it was a privilege and a pleasure. And the way I started on Sunday morning by thanking the congregation uh, was very heartfelt. It was mm. a joy. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a mercy and a grace, right? When people come back after uh, <laughs> to hear you preach yeah. again. I, I always think that. Uh, it's true. It's like, oh, man, these people are, again, is, anyway, they're not coming for you. They're coming no. for the word. And that's right. If you grow, grow grass, the, the sheep will come and eat it. So yes, it's good. Uh, let's talk. A, a, for, take a, a few minutes to talk about this past sermon, which was the final sermon. I loved your introduction. Uh, so Galatians six eleven through eighteen was the final passage uh, in uh, the letter. I absolutely love the introduction that you used with the ivy covering over. Uh, I love that you brought it back at the end, and uh, just the way that you kind of applied that. How often is um, you know the emphasis of boasting in Christ crucified, how the, the, the vines of the ivy of the world, of the flesh, of that growing over that, obscuring that, hiding that, uh, that was just a very helpful stuck in my mind. And uh, we need to chop that down and throw it in the fire uh, so that we continue to make sure that that's our emphasis. So I appreciated that very much. And um, yeah, just a lot that you could think through in terms of uh, personal application in that regard. So I really, I uh, just again, this is tied back to your. You're the one who's preached through the letter. Your your context in bringing us up to where we were at the end of the letter was just so precise and concise. It's like, oh, you've been in this for months now, mm -hmm. and you just you know this inside and out, and you're able to bring us right up to this point very quickly, very easily. Uh, that was that was really helpful uh, for me. So great. Well, I almost chopped that part because I was getting a little long. Glad and, you did. Uh, wondered about ah, do I need to update everyone on the status of Galatians again? <laughs> no, that was I found that very always find it very useful because right. we're not remembering from yeah. week to week to week right. um, or where we've been and, and where we're going. So always useful mm. for you personal application wise. How did the Lord use this in your life? The sermon text. Yeah, it was you know it was interesting to think through this theme of boasting as a whole, and uh, I especially enjoy digging into the verses that precede what is probably the better known verses in this text. So yes. as Paul was talking about the Judaizers again, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ, etc. I always sort of quickly read over those verses because I'm like, oh, verse 14 is coming. Yes. This is who the Christian is. And it was interesting to wrestle through that. That was the point I wrestled through the most this week. Um, everything else came very quickly. And, um, I, you know, on, on Thursday, as I'm typing up the sermon, I spent all day Thursday as I was writing just doing introduction and point one. Then I called a family member and I said, hey, can I give you my first point for the sermon? And I called another family member, hey, can I give you my first point for the sermon? And just really trying to make sure that that was like well sort of polished and oiled and like accurate to the text. It was fascinating to think about those three sub points. Yeah, people pleasers, persecution dodgers, lawbreakers. Yeah. That's people who boast in works righteousness. Yeah. And I think it's something that we really need to be on alert for because, you know, you can see it on Christian Twitter, like the interactions that happen there. You can you can see it happen in congregations among groups of friends or even groups within a congregation where people are trying to win you over to their view of things, right? And, uh, and, and they are um, they're vindicated. The more people that you can win over to your view is vindicating, right? And that appeals to the flesh. Yeah. Because uh, you're, oh, you know, people are, or if you're beholden to a particular view or person, and uh, you want their approval, so you're going to line up behind them yeah. in terms of, you know, this is how you view this portion of Scripture. This is the practice that Christians, if you're really a Christian, you will do this. Yeah. You won't do that. And when we want approval, yeah, we'll line up behind people like that. And all of a sudden, the emphasis is not on the grace of Christ, the cross of Christ, but it's on something else as what defines us on, on what it means to be a Christian. And I think that's very prevalent um, it's everywhere. Yes. And so we we really have to be on guard for that. Well, and what's interesting, and I, you know, if I had had more time, this would have been a further application under that people pleaser side of things. 
number one, it's it's interesting how often we're trying to please a very small group of people. So the Judaizers, like, they're not this massive group. Like, when you think about the whole ancient world, right? Yeah, sure, absolutely. They're just a small little group, and we're trying to please the top dogs in this particular area. It, isn't that so often the case with us? We want to please a certain group of people who form a very small part of maybe evangelicalism, maybe not evangelicalism, maybe, and then the world in total. Mm -hmm. And it's going, oh man, this is, that's just something to assess. The, the second thing is, just because the view exists doesn't mean it is legitimate, right? So, yes. we, we, or that it should get equal airtime. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So other people believe this, other people are pushing this. Other people are writing scholarly things about this and doing research on this. Yeah, well, they're wasting their life. And they're wasting their research, right? Like, like just because a Four Views book, and I'm speaking theologically mm -hmm. here, you know, Zondervan has a Four Views, yep. um, a huge series, maybe 50 books in the series. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm dramatic. not sure. Yeah. There, there, and then uh, B&H has a Four, Three, Five Views series. There are tons of views on every topic under the sun. That doesn't mean that all those views are legitimate. Nope. Right? And, and so sometimes we try to people please and we go, well, hey, look, there's people in my camp. Well, just because there are people in your camp doesn't mean that what you are holding to and what you are aspiring to get accolades from other people from is legitimate. Absolutely. So yeah, anyways, just some particularities oh, there that really are good. interesting to explore. And, and we, we watch our heart in that regard. What is it that we're looking to get? Mm -hmm. Is it approval, vindication, affirmation? Uh, we have to be very thoughtful about... Um, how we do that. And I, I've always been helped by Paul's wording um, in uh, Corinthians when he talks about it. it's a very little thing if I'm judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. It, it's the, My conscience is clear. It's the Lord who judges me. I'm going to wait for what he says. And that's one way to silence groups that are out there who are trying to win us over to their view, who will try to um, assure us that we're all, everything's good, uh, you're, you're right with God, etc. if you do this, that, or the next thing. Um, and it's not emphasizing the cross of Christ as the basis of our righteous standing with God. So, yeah, there's a lot there mm -hmm. for sure. I loved your, uh, I really appreciated the, the way you just, your definition of what it means to boast. Uh, there's really no English sort of equivalent, but use a lot of synonyms to glory in, rejoice in, revel in, fills our horizon, fills our time, expends our energy. It's our obsession. And when it's defined that way, you realize, oh, it, 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 this, this encompasses all of life. And then you start to talk about what the cross is. And you gave all of those, I don't know how many, it was like nine or 10, maybe 11 different you know, we see the cross tells us of the love of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God, the victory of God, the forgiveness of God, the cleansing of God, the redemption of God, the propitiation of God, uh, the justification of God, the peace of God, the glory of God. Well, yeah, when you start delineating all of those things, no kidding we're to boast in the cross of Christ and, and nothing else uh, because of everything that, uh, because of all that it means. So uh, we could have spent forever there. Mm hmm uh, on that alone. So I, I just, I really appreciated that you took that much time to just expand on and expound on, um, why it is then we would boast in the cross because of what that means. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really absolutely. Well I, was, I was thinking, you know, I, I really want to define cross and, uh, I want to contrast it with, you know, what is a cross, you know, and what is the cross being spoken of here? Two very different things, two slabs of wood attached together. That's not what we're talking about. We're not just even speaking about a cross where we would crucify an individual. We are speaking of the cross of the Lord Jesus yes. Christ. That's the cross we're boasting in. If we're boasting in any cross, oh boy, we're in trouble. Yep. And, you know, thus, you know, why I, I quoted uh, Cicero and we talked about like boasting in a lethal injection or the mm -hmm. electric chair mm -hmm. because it is a terrible thing Absolutely. to speak of. It's just become very normal to us yeah. in Christ a Christian context. But if we were to watch a physical crucifixion, uh, that we would be greatly disturbed mm -hmm. at what it is that we were seeing. And it's not just that physical aspect yeah. uh, either. The, Jesus was judged in our place. So, um, yeah, that's good. That's right. Helpful. Uh, I thought of a, a story that um, it, from the life of Augustine when you got to talking about we are a crucified people. So I've heard someone else say that there are three crucifixions in this text, yeah. right? There's yeah. there's uh, there's Christ's, 
then there's the, like the world has been crucified to us so it's dead as far as we're concerned and then we've been crucified to the world so we're dead as yep. far as the world is concerned and so there's those you know um so that whole like i'm my the old me is dead yes so you really had me reflecting on that the mm -hmm. old me is dead it made me think of the story in augustine's life where he returned uh, as the story goes, he returns to a place he formerly lived, and and he was um, he he engaged and indulged in a lot of sexual sin, yes, uh, which you can read about in his confessions. And uh, the story is told that one of his former lovers or a prostitute saw him and called to him and said, "Augustine, it's I." And he said, "Yes, but it is not I." Because he'd become a Christian. And so he's he was saying, I'm dead. That Augustine you know is dead. It's not me anymore. It's a new Augustine. Yeah. No, I just found out that apparently that's just a not a true story. But oh, it it's a great, story. a great illustration. <laughs> um but uh that's that we are that crucif we are crucified people. Yeah. And we're new creations. We're a new creation people. And uh I yeah, that was you had me really thinking about that. Um and that being one of the main themes um in the letter of, of Galatians. So Consider your new status. Yes. The old you is dead. The new you is alive in Christ. Live accordingly as God's people. How does Paul want to conclude his letter? Yeah, he, he takes a shot again at the Judaizers, a helpful shot. But he wants them more than anything to recognize that something new has taken place. And so he stacks up terms. You're a crucified people, a new creation people. You're God's people. And he had begun the letter that way too. Right? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. We are still participants in the present evil age, but not actively as those who are um, condoning it and part of it and yes. enslaved to it. We, we, we exist in the present evil age as those who are the new creation and hope for the consummation of the new creation. So we are in the world, but we are not, not of this of world. world. Yeah. It's it's an amazing bookend to the letter. It's good. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, you had an exegetical decision to make. Yes. On verse... 16. 16. As for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So the decision there is... Uh, is Paul talking about two different distinct groups of people? Or is he talking about one group of people? And uh, on, just on this verse alone, people could go in two different directions. In fact, they do go in two different directions. So some people, there's a distinction between Israel and the church. Uh, you went the other way, and so you're taking the Greek word and, uh, to be, which can also legitimately be translated as even also, namely. That is. That is. So the... Um, all who walk by this rule, peace and, peace and mercy be upon them, even, or that is, upon the Israel of God. And in the verse itself, you don't necessarily have clear direction on one way, which way to go, one way or the other, on how to translate that. But you did something really important I just want to highlight. You used the context of Galatians to inform your decision on your understanding of that verse, that there's not two groups of people being mentioned there's one you just talk about that for a minute again yeah the i mean the entire thrust of the letter is a response to the judaizers saying hey there's still there there's still something about jews that's different from gentiles in, in, in many ways right like they they're circumcised they obey the law so you gentiles yeah you believe in jesus and all that stuff you just got to go one step further you got to become a little bit jewish and you gotta get circumcised. You gotta obey the law, right? And so the entire—that's been the entire argument of the Judaizers that Paul is pushing against, and he pushes against that with some very key statements. I mean, he 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 speaks about in three twenty-eight. He says there is neither Jew nor Greek, and so as it pertains to ethnicity, when it comes to the Christian faith, oh, you're all one. We don't need these distinctions any longer. There, there is no separation between Israel and, and, and the rest of the world. This is, the people of God are one people. And so for us then to interpret this last phrase as this is, he's just speaking to ethnic Israel now, that would confuse what he's been saying all along in the letter. And then also he, he speaks about in 3, 7, and 9, I'm just finding it here, now then, that it is those of faith 
who are the son, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, those of faith. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So there's this realization of blessing in Jesus Christ for all the nations, for every people, not just an ethnic Jew, but, but, but Jew and Gentile. So then, he concludes, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So you take all of this theology, all of this argument from the letter, and you get to the end and you read the Israel of God. And I think you have to conclude in many ways, it's a compelling conclusion that he is speaking of all those who belong to Jesus as being the very people of God. That's very good. Very helpful. And has really significant implications, and we'll get to this a little bit more when we return to Exodus, especially in the fifth commandment when Paul talks about the land, um, because the convictions that we have regarding the uh, nature of the who the people of God is uh, is going to influence uh, and direct how we might respond to things even in the contemporary news cycles today, such as what's happening in Israel, between Palestine and Israel and, and the conflict there and those types of things. And some people in our church wish that we would talk about these things more because they have a particular view of uh, ethnically Jewish people. And uh, some people are, are fine that we're not talking about it more, but we hear from time to time um, people who have a different theological conviction uh, and understanding of you know God's place for ethnic Israel and the church and how all of, the, all of that relates together. But I think you make a compelling argument based on the letter that when Paul Paul actually uses the term Israel of God to refer to Jew and Gentile together in the church. Not that the church has replaced Israel, but there's one new man in the uh, and and so that's right. That that's uh, so there's not a replacement theology here. I wouldn't ascribe to Gentiles that. Gentiles are grafted in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, you're 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 basing that. Um, you're. Your conclusion on Galatians six sixteen is based on the whole letter, uh, where you read other things too, like and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Promise, just like the ethnic Jew who believed in the promises that were yes. to come, or an ethnic Jew who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, they are with the Gentile, one man in Christ, no distinction. Ephesians two thirteen, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So so we don't only want to look, we want to look at the context of the letter as a whole, then we want to look at Pauline theology as a whole, mm -hmm. and then biblical theology, which is yes. what what is the movement of the covenants? What is the movement of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? And all of this helps us on three simple words, the Israel of God. That's right. It's four simple words. Yeah, there you go. That's good. That math is not your strong suit. Just yeah, that's right. Fine. Uh, just last couple of comments, unless there's anything else you want to add before we wrap up. Um, the uh, the Lloyd Jones story uh, on you know th that was fantastic. Just helping us understand what it means to boast in Christ in a particular instance of life, old, weak, failing, yeah. not able to engage in ways that we did before in service to the Lord, but in a sense, irrelevant in that the promise is still ours. Nothing's we, changed. Nothing's changed. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Rest in this, embrace this, great exhortations. And uh, I appreciate your very pointed applications on what it means to, to bear suffering for Christ's sake. The marks of the cross will be on us in different ways, shapes, forms. For Paul, he had physical marks. Uh, there were other aspects he could surely talk about as well. But rejection, ridicule, scorn... We should expect that there will be marks on us as those who boast in the cross, and we should not be ashamed of that, mm. nor should we shy away from that. Uh, so that was really helpful um, that you just brought that out into the open based on what Paul was writing in conclusion there. So, And then uh, some people may not have known the history of yeah. our church. Uh, so I appreciate that you brought that in at the end. This was the first sermon, uh, the text, uh, that was likely ever preached in the history of uh, that was preached in the history of what we now know as Hasper Baptist Church. And so may indeed God preserve that to be the message going forward. It's incumbent on all of us as a church to watch that phrase on the side of our church building. It's not there, but, you know, it's it's there. We want to preach Christ crucified. We want to boast in Christ crucified. And so church, together, let's 
Let's aim was the exhortation to cut any ivy down, any distractions, any any things that are going to hinder Jesus Christ and him crucified being the the proclamation of this church and the individual Christian who belongs to this church. That's a member responsibility. Which really goes all the way back to the beginning of the letter where Paul puts the whole church on notice. He's not writing to just the elders. Right. He's not writing to just the pastors or the deacons. He's writing to the churches. Churches. And he says to all of them, if we even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Mm-hmm. It's the responsibility of the whole church to ensure that we don't drift away from preaching Christ crucified. So great concluding exhortation to uh, a wonderful series. No, praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for uh, what's coming next in the preaching calendar. Before we get right back to Exodus, there will be an interjection in 1 Timothy 1 to talk about the law before we go right back into the second table of the law with honor your father and your mother.